Well, Grace, I've been wheeling and dealing so long today in the studio that I forgot I have not even ate. But that's okay. Why is that okay? Because the Brilliantly Dumb Show is presented to you by Postmates. For a limited time, Postmates has given our listeners $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days using promo code BROBIBLE. $100 of free delivery credit with Postmates. Download that app now. Anything you need, anytime you need it, Postmate it. Hi, folks. Coming to you live here on the Burnley Dumb Show, rocking and rolling. This is what we do. That's Grace Ibrahim behind the glass on the ones and twos. Big game, Bob, coming to you live. However, you're listening, why ever you're listening. We're just happy you are listening. Folks, it's an interview day today here on the Burnley Dumb Show. Next up to the table, an ESPN personality, Woody Page. For those of you who don't know Woody Page, Woody Page has been on ESPN for years. He's had a show with Stuart Scott, Skip Bayless, Stephen A. Smith. He's seen it all in ESPN for years and years and years. Covered the Denver Broncos as a journalist for 35 years, University of Tennessee. Um, Good friends with John Elway. He knows a lot of people in sports. Um, A guy with a ton of sports stories. My goal going into this interview is going to be hopping on in just a bit. What I would really like to do is get the the behind-the-scenes of ESPN. I'm fascinated with ESPN. I'm fascinated with networks that try and go up against ESPN because they no one ever seems to be able to get the job done. They're just a monopoly. ESPN has been running the sports game for years and years and years now. I've always been fascinated with different ESPN personalities like the Stephen A. Smiths. I you know I wanted to find it, is he Is he really like that off the air or is he really that animated? Try and get him to talk some shit on Skip Bayless. Really get the behind the scenes view of what's going on between ESPN and bust his balls. He's a ball buster. I'll bust right back. Um, And and that's what we're looking forward to do here on Woody Page. Uh, Folks, hope you've been enjoying the ride. I know damn well I have been enjoying. We're pumping up some vlogs, by the way. Pumping up, Bobby is into the vlog game. I did the International Carpool Goes Golfing on the YouTube. Go check that out. Let's keep the ball rolling. Right now, we're going to go ahead and bring in Sir Woody Page coming in hot. Folks, enjoy the show. Mr. Woody Page. Can you hear me, Robbie? How are you today, sir? Oh, great. Happy to be with you. Thanks. You know, I tell you, Woody, I've been doing a lot of these Zoom interviews. That was one of the more bizarre entrances to the Zoom. They set it up, and it's kind of like the president is walking in. I don't see anybody. I see the podium and everything all set up. We just, we don't know when you're you're coming. And here we are. You're three minutes early. You're ready to rock and roll. What an entrance. Woody Page. Well, the blackboard was here. (laughs) Yeah. That's true. I had the I had the board in the back. It was interesting. You kind of kept me on my toes there, Woody. Woody, are you ready to rock and roll here? Sure. Where okay. are you? I like guys that are off the cuff. I like guys that are off the riff. No filter. Let's it fly. That's Woody Page. And that's why I'm happy to have you here today, Woody Page. Woody, have you ever read your Wikipedia? Uh, no. <laughs> Never read the Wikipedia? Let me no, tell you... My- my daughter read it once, she said, and uh, she cleaned up a couple of things. Uh, yeah, let me let me go ahead and read it. We're not going to leave the full thing because they put quite a whole lot. You've done a lot in your day, huh, Woody? Uh, not much today. I yeah. went on a two-hour walk. <laughs> That's not it. much today. Did you do a few things throughout your career? Well, it's been long. I'll be 74 this month, and uh, so I've been doing it for 60 years, I think. Something All right, like- here's what we got. Woodrow Wilson Page Jr. is a sports columnist for the Gazette, author, and a regular panelist on the ESPN Sports Talk program Around the Horn. He was a columnist for the Denver Post for 35 years and co-host of Cold Pizza and its spinoff show, First and Ten, until November 4th, 2016. Let's rock and roll here, Mr. Page. Woody, you did 35 years in Denver. You might have more pull in Denver at that point than John Elway. Did you just walk around that stadium like you owned it? 
No, I didn't walk around the stadium because I usually run into people who would say hello and want to talk about sports. So uh, I, I will tell you, though, that the one time I walked around the stadium was up in Boulder. You've heard of Boulder, haven't you? Yeah, you know, of course. It's sort of like the Republic of Boulder. Uh, right after I started Around the Horn about 18 years ago, I was going to quit because I thought I was terrible. I thought the show was terrible. I was up at a University of Colorado football game, and I, I went out for a walk to try and kind of figure out what I was supposed to be doing in life because I had told uh, ESPN I was ready to quit. We'd only been on the air a couple of months. And suddenly I was surrounded by about 100 college students who said they watch the show every day. And I found that funny given that uh, none of my friends watched it. Uh, it, it was ripped all over television. It was ripped in newspaper columns by guys that I'd helped get jobs for. And I had told ESPN I wanted to quit and, and move on my life. And they said, well, let us get somebody else. Well, I was surrounded by all these college students. And I thought, I wonder what this is all about. And a young lady came up to me and said, Bobby Page, you are Bobby Page. And I went, no, no. And people were kind of laughing. And she said, oh, yeah. My boyfriend watches you every day. Bobby Page, Bobby Page. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, we were having sex yesterday and he was watching you on the show. And I went, yeah, that's more information than I really want. And she said, would you sign an autograph for my boyfriend? And I said, sure, what's his name? She said, Tommy. I said, dear Tommy, uh, thanks for watching the show, but you're the first person I've heard that watches it while you're having sex, best wishes. Bobby Page. And she said, see, I told you you were Bobby Page. So I wondered <laughs> what would happen when he got home, when she got home and said, uh, I got Bobby Page's autograph. So I don't, I don't know if that's a, person. that's a compliment. Yeah, that, I don't know yeah. if that's a compliment to you about how good you are on TV or if that's a bad thing for her. Maybe she just wasn't so good at sex. <laughs> Apparently not. But I went home that night and I called ESPN the next day and I said, I'll keep doing this. I Let said, me ask you something. What do you show? Think? That catches me right away because what surprises me, you've been, you were a journalist your whole life. You go to Tennessee for journalism, okay? Isn't the golden standard to get to ESPN? Not then. At that time, <laughs> what, was, what was the golden standard back then for a guy like you going to Tennessee? Where did you want to end up ideally? I grew up reading the sporting news and sport magazine and then later Sports Illustrated, and I thought, that would be what you would call the gold standard, that if you could write someday for one of those magazines, and I ended up uh, contributing to all three over a period of time. I wrote a column for the Sporting News for years, and I was a contributing editor here to the Sport Magazine, and then I wrote a few pieces for Sports Illustrated. You know but, what I like about you, Woody? Can I tell you what I like about you? You have been able to adapt. You started in the game earlier. Okay, you, you've been in it for a long time. You've been able to adapt to the changes in media, whether that's be starting newspapers, then going to podcast. Are you tired of the change in media? Not really. I, I once asked Dikembe Mutombo, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with him. Of course. Not he today, speaks so. seven languages, and you can't understand him in any of the seven because he's got this <laughs> great, great voice. It's I like that. Dikembe Mutombo really has incredible presence. And I said to him once, uh, when you were a kid in Nigeria, did you grow up thinking about playing uh, professional basketball? And he said, Woody, I didn't even know there was the NBA. I mean, he, he said, I couldn't dream beyond the end of the road. And you think about it, when I was a kid in college in the 60s, I was thinking about the uh, the Vietnam War and how I would be dying in the Vietnam War, participated in the marches, uh, participated in civil rights marches, and actually went on in my first job to cover civil rights and, and the uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, which is where I'm from. But ESPN came along in 79, so I couldn't dream of anything. I, I, I did talk radio for years and years, but thank you. That I, I tell young people that when I speak, when that, the most recent one was up in Boulder just before the pandemic, and, and I said, whatever you are dreaming of, forget about it, because five years from now, it'll be a new one. There'll be something else. 
Robbie, you couldn't have dreamed of, uh, you could have dreamed of being a comedian, which you are, and your podcast I really like. Uh, here I'm kissing your ass. Right That's away. okay. Keep going, Woody. By all means, nobody's going to stop you there. Well, you couldn't have dreamed of a podcast five years ago. No, no, no. It wasn't Nobody even a thing. And so, what what's happening? And life is changing, and that's good right now. I hope that there's a lot about life that's changing as a result of what we've gone through the last three months or so. But, and I mean that in a positive way in terms of uh, racial equality in this country, and and also in regard to how we treat pandemics, pandemics uh, that. Uh, Life is changing. And so you and I are sitting here doing a podcast from you five years from now. We'll okay. be doing uh, comedians meeting cars with driverless car or something. You know, the, right. There'll right. be a show in a car and it won't be. Uh, I, you, you, know what's been interesting, you know what's been interesting for me, Woody, and I, I definitely wanted to jump into the ESPN at some point. You guys have pretty much, with the coronavirus going on, been scrambling for things to talk about. Has it been weird going to Around the Horn and you're kind of figuring out what the hell are we going to talk about each day? Oddly enough, um, we have a conference call in the morning. We'll have uh, seven or eight or nine stories. By the way, this is my ESPN studio. Phenomenal. Again. Loved that. They, they built it in my office. We're all Love doing that. it from home like everybody else. But we'll have seven or eight topics of discussion. Uh, so even though they are not, well, what happened in the game last night, we'll talk about uh, you know, Major League Baseball and what's going on between the owners and the players. We'll talk about uh, the protests, the bubble boys. But, it, but know, isn't Orlando. that tough about your guys in particular time slot too? Because I've always wondered that too. You start the shows at what, six in the morning. So how do you take it to where you have show after show after show to when they get to you, which is at 4 p.m., 5 p.m. for around the horn, Eastern Standard Time? Do you kind of have to look at what other shows talked about before and try and twist it and change it to some degree? No, I, you know, I did cold pizza in the mornings for a long time with Skip Bayless. And we were like the first show on the air in the mornings. You know, totally. we come on at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I, I, we didn't set the standard or set the flow of the day, but we had first shot at it. And we did a show that was a uh, sort of a spinoff from that. First and Ten? First and Take. Yeah. First, first and Take. Yeah, First and Ten, then First Take. And then... After they moved the show from New York to to Bristol, because they were cutting back on expenses expenses in New York, uh, I was tired of Skip Bayless. And I'm saying that honestly. I was just going to ask you what it's like to wake up with with Skip Bayless. Does it does it, it just it's too much? Is it just too much, Woody? Well, the way you said it, that I woke up with Skip Bayless. <laughs> I, didn't wake up. I wouldn't wake up with Skip Bayless. I'll I'll, I'll tell you one story that was toward the end of it. Uh, I got so tired of working with him, and it it, it, it was interesting because he genuinely would. Uh, I don't take myself or sports that seriously. He genuinely believes in what he says, but we had a conference call, as we did every morning at three thirty. So we did set the objectives for the day because it was we we would meet shortly after most of the games had finished playing, and obviously. And one morning, Jay Crawford, who was the, one of the hosts of the sure. show, said, okay, guys, we have this funny uh, question to, in the program. Uh, golf Magazine says that uh, golfers, and you play golf. Yep, absolutely. Golfers would give up sex for an entire year if they could improve their handicap by four strokes. <laughs> what about you, Woody? And I said, there are a lot of years I've given up sex, and I didn't improve my <laughs> And I said, sure, I would. Yes, in a minute. I would give up sex for a full year if I could go from, I was about Till this day, to, you stand by um, that till this day? You would still take off a year of sex for four strokes on your handicap? Oh, absolutely. Now, no doubt about it. At the time, I was about a 12 or 13. Okay. Now I'm about a 16 or 17. So, yeah, sure. Would you? I'm asking you. At this juncture in my life, I don't think so. Maybe when I get to my fifties or, or something, and I'm I, I you know I've had enough sex to kind of be tired of it, then that I would do it. But yeah. I don't think right now. So anyway, that was my answer. And they turned. There were about ten people in the room: producers, interns, uh, directors. 
And they said to Skip, would you give up sex for, I don't know that I've ever told this story, totally. would you give up sex for a year to improve your golf game? And he said, I have a great golf game. He said, I've had more sex than anybody in this room combined. There's 10 people in the room. You've had more sex than everybody combined. And there wasn't any laughter or anything. He wasn't being funny. He was being serious. And and the producer of the show at the time said, uh, that's not the answer we want you to give on the air, you know, give something else. So we go on the air, we're live. That show was live in the morning for two hours. It was like the Today Show, a sports version of the right, Today yeah. Show. And so we come, we're toward the end of the show, and they said, okay, what do you got a funny story here? Uh, Golf Magazine, da, da, da. would you give up sex for a year? And I told them the same story. I said, of course I would, yes. In fact, I'll give up sex for two years if I can improve it by six strokes in handicap. And so Jay turned to Skip and said, would you give up sex for a year if you could improve your golf game? And he said, I've had more sex than Woody's ever even thought about. <laughs> I got up, we were at a sort of a- This is on table. live TV, right, Woody? Yeah. So I got up and I went over and I started choking him. That's not a good thing for you, but I, I grabbed him by the throat and Honestly, he was, he worked out every day. He was in a lot better shape than me. I did a lot of, a lot of drinking in New York and uh, hanging out in bars. That uh, argument got into a fight that ended up on the floor. You can look at it, find it on YouTube. And close by was a door to 8th and 34th Street in New York City. And we kind of opened the door and just went outside. This is like and a scene said, out of Rocky. And we could hear the producer director and they said, let it go, let it go. And so we're like tumbling into the street on live television doing this, uh, do, doing this fight. And, and I was genuinely upset with him because they told him don't do that. And I'd had enough. It sounds like you were genuinely, you took him out to 8th and 34th Street. Woody, was that, the, was that the end of the show? Did you guys have to come back on? No, that was the end of it. And for people who are familiar with New York, that's like a block and a half from Empire State Building and Macy's. And so we were, we were out basically on the street, cops coming up, uh, cameras around. It was funny into our relationship, basically. So was that. it known then on the show that you and Skip didn't like each other? Did you guys try and hide it or you pretty much let your feelings fly? That's it. That's nobody's ever asked me that because uh, you're not old enough and nobody uh, paying attention to this podcast. But I could never understand why the Beatles broke up, that Paul and John didn't like each other at the end. More famous when I was a kid was Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, yep. who were the biggest. Pretty good comparisons here, Woody. Well, we certainly weren't in that category, but we were doing a national, we were doing a uh, like three national TV shows, and I was doing a show at night called Dream Job. Yeah, there were, for you did that with Stuart Scott, Scott, right? Yeah, Stu Scott was the uh, was the host. I was on it with Stephen A. Smith. Sure, we were judges, and it was kind of like American Idol, their version of American Idol. The winner got to be a, an anchor person on the ESPN for a year, and I think one of the guys is still with the ESPN network that we did. We did three seasons of it, but uh, anyway, Skip and I were doing these shows. And I was doing another show with a guy named Jay Mariotti. Sure, the, yeah, you uh, and Jay Mariotti used to they used to call him yeah. Dick. So, so Robbie, when you were when yeah, I called him Richard all the time. So when I die, would you come to the funeral and say he's the only guy that ever worked in history with Stephen A. Smith, Jay Mariotti, and Skip Bayless? <laughs> yeah. So, true. so so anyway, yeah, we didn't get along. We didn't get along. So. I finally got how people who were McCartney, Lennon, how they broke up, that you, it's like a marriage. So is it safe to say when Skip Bayless makes the move to Fox, that didn't affect your day at all? You were almost happy. I, I called my daughter and I said, you know, if I just stuck with Skip, because uh, he got, I think, six and a half million dollars. And truthfully, yeah. I, never made, I never made that kind of money in my life. And I said to my daughter, I said, if I had stuck with Skip, I'd be now on Fox making six and a half million dollars. She said, no, dad. And my daughter's an adult. She said, one of you would have been dead. 
<laughs> that's the truth because we were we were verging on that after three years it's, so you, you, you know and i i know you had said they just so if, if you the way i think of it if you and skip Bayless butted heads i find it very hard to believe that you and stephen a smith didn't butt heads Not the same. We were on the we were on the show, uh, Dream Job, and one night, uh, you know, the, the one of the finalists was in front of us. We were up on a high podium. There were a couple other judges, and they would appear in front of us, and that had to be daunting for them. And Stuart would say, "So, what'd you think of his performance?" And Stephen A. Smith said, "The bottom line is, at the end of the day." what you came to the table with was too many cliches. And I started just laughing out loud. And so they came to me and they said, what do, you, what do you think of this guy? I said, I want to keep him. The guy with all the cliches is Stephen A. Smith. And so <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, so Stephen A. didn't like me much and Jay Mariotti really didn't like me because I called him Richard every day and told ESPN and said, Stop why calling him Richard. calling him Richard? And I said, well, because I can't call him Dick. So I called him Richard. So my thing with Stephen with Stephen A. Smith, okay, is obviously he's very entertaining. Can't doubt that. You, I speak to you. I, I listen to you on ESPN. I know that's who you are and how you are. When I watch a Stephen A. Smith or even a Skip Bayless, and again, I'm saying they're very entertaining. It seems almost like they're cranking it up five to ten notches to the point where it almost may be a little too much. Would you agree with that? No, not at all. Uh, forgive me, but that's not right. They're both genuine. Uh, having and, and Jay Mariotti, I'll throw him in. All three of them were genuine about their opinions, about the way they described them. I mean, that exactly was, was Skip Bayless. But when I went to Cold Pizza, it was, uh, it was during, uh, they had asked me to come to New York. I had uh, Max Kellerman sure. and I sure. were together at Around the Horn and Fox offered us both the job to go over to Fox, the story really hasn't been told, to do a show called Max and Woody. And it was gonna be based on pardon interruption. We had been rather successful in the first year or so of Rat the Horn. And Fox was trying to gear up then to take on ESPN. They're doing it again with yep. all these shows they've got. They've tried before and it didn't work out. But they offered us a lot of money, a lot more money than we were making at ESPN. And and Max took the took the job, and I decided my agent and I decided I'd rather stay at ESPN. And ESPN made me an offer that included going to New York and working for Cold Pizza. And as a result of that, um, uh, Max went over there and did a show called IMAX that was on Fox for a year or so ago, year or so, and and then it. They took it off the air, and then Max kind of floated around. He out went space. to HBO for a little bit, I think, right? Kelly well, he was doing boxing on HBO, but yeah. he kind of floated around, and it, you know, it's come back, and now he—it's kind of a funny world, and now flips you, around. But, so I ended up doing a cold pizza, and we must have tried out. We auditioned about 70, 80 guys, rap artists ex-athletes, uh, writers from around the country. Most of them were African-American. That's what we were going for at the time was, and the guy that I picked out that I liked the best was Michael Smith, who yeah. did, uh, Michael Smith with Jamel Hill did the- uh, they, They've had thing. more shows than, I mean, it's just, they got a new show each week, it seems like. Yeah, so anyway, uh, the president of ESPN called me and said, uh, I, what do you think of Skip Bayless? And I said, well, I've known him forever. But I said, that's kind of an odd having two white, old, middle-aged white guys. We were in our 50s. And so they said, let's try it out. And so came, and there was the gritting of teeth, and there was a grinding of the two of us. And they said, what do you think? And I said, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. And so uh, it was it was fun for quite a while, except uh, – we just didn't get along. I mean, we wouldn't, when we weren't on the air, we didn't talk to each other. Off the air, there was nothing. He would go in his dressing room uh, and he'd do his own makeup and his own hair. We had a studio audience, which people don't remember. I'd go up and talk to the studio audience. He would drink a couple of Red Bulls every hour 
and I was tired because it's tough to get up at 3.30 in the morning. Anybody that knows that, when you're up watching games till midnight or oh. in the morning. So I, people were could tell that we didn't really get along with each other very well. Skip's got Stephen an a, ex- insane regimen. Stephen A and I uh, had a just a distance kind of relationship, but I'll tell you, Stephen A, that's genuine. He it is, is huh? Really, oh, totally. Uh, who's a guy, say, Woody? Who's a guy at ESPN that you've always admired that just does it the right way, from a talent perspective, also just being a good guy or girl? Well, you brought up Stuart Scott. He was uh, probably the most uh, professional guy I worked with. Nice to everybody. The lady, we would have our hair done on, on that show and makeup, uh, dream job. He, he would go up and greet everybody and say hello. Genuinely, the nicest guy in the world. Van Pelt. Yep. Does yeah, that nice. doesn't surprise me. He one seems the, like the man. One of the, one of the most genuinely good guys around. And I think that's true of, uh, you know, Hannah Storm. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, Linda Cohen. Linda Cohen, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just think that uh, most of the people that I work with, with a uh, couple of exceptions, the people on, around the horn, they ask if we get along. Uh, uh, Bomani Jones and I mm, were kind of opposites in terms of, I think he thought I was an old uh, Southern white guy, racist kind of guy. But uh, as we went on together, I think he had a different perception of me and and I I enjoyed being around him. And Bomani's carved out a great career for himself. Uh, So uh, dinner time, Rob, what are you thinking? Al, I I actually think I'm going to go with my fourth dish of chicken parm this week. You're a a chicken parmaholic, bro. Can't stop. Yeah. And I can get it anytime I want, anytime I need it. You can. You know how? No, tell me. Using the Postmates app. I love it. From an early morning breakfast burrito to a bottle of wine after work, maybe that bottle of wine turns into three bottles of wine, Alex. You could Postmate some Advil, too. They do it all over at Postmates. For a limited time only, Postmates has given our listeners $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. To start your free deliveries, download the app and use code BROBIBLE. That's code BROBIBLE for $100 of free delivery credit with no minimum purchase for your first seven days when you download the Postmates app. Alex, that's a lot of fucking bottles of wine right And there. chicken parm. And chicken parms. A little bit, a little bit of both. Anything you need. Anytime you need it, post made it. I did. And I go, yeah, that works. <laughs> so, Woody, who was the, you know about writing jokes. And writing Woody, lines. who who was the best? Who was the most the, the best time you've had getting drunk with in the sports world? Did you and, and John Elway ever hit it off at a bar? Or who yeah, we, you wasted. We, with? we did. I, I have one that pops in my head, but I, when John was a rookie, I had already met him when he was at Stanford. The Broncos trained in Greeley, Colorado, and there was a bar there that used to be a a military club or something. And he grabbed me one night with uh, uh, two of his offensive linemen and said, uh, Brother Barwitz, 10 beers for a dollar. So Elway asks you, Elway comes over to you and he says, Woody, let's go get some beers with two other offensive linemen. Of course you say yes, right? Sure. And the the big draw that night was 10 beers for a dollar. We got 40 beers. (laughs) It came in plastic cups. Each one of us got 10 beers. So it's four (laughs) dollars. Did Elway smash 10 beers that night? Yeah, we all did. (laughs) No. And that was before Mothers Against Drunk Driving. That was before people cared. And so we're in uh, two or three cars driving down the streets of Greeley, Colorado, a small town. And they could have put all four of us in jail. So, I mean, it wasn't something that what we card After Elway gets blasted, what car does he get in after? Does he go into like a convertible or? Uh, he had a Corvette at the time. So Elway's come. He's smashed, hammer drunk, gets into the Corvette. That's a wrap for Woody Page and John Elway that night. Yeah. But the story, the most fun I had was in, in uh, with somebody one night, Monte Carlo, 
you remember the dream. Everybody remembers. Oh the dream. yeah, of course, because that infamous practice. Yeah, and after one of the practices before that, uh, so I was there with about seven. There were only about seven media people there. I mean, somebody from Sports Illustrated, Bob Ryan, who I brought up earlier from Boston, a couple of guys from Chicago. Gotcha. And we hung out. We stayed in the same hotel with the uh, the players. The players. And we'd sit around the pool and talk. And so we'd go to practice and then hang out with the players. And I walked into the casino there, which is the original casino. And that's why and Monte, Monte Carlo. Carlo existed, because the King of France said to his buddy, I'm going to give you a little country. You can have gambling there. Because France was a major Catholic country, and gotcha. gambling wasn't permitted. So that's why Monte Carlo started. And so I went into the casino and I sat down and I was playing the equivalent of 25 bucks. So that would be 75 francs or something like right. that. And Michael Jordan sat down. Next oh, week. I was hoping it was going to be Jordan, Woody. Talk to me, baby. Talk to me, yeah. Woody. And, and I'd gotten to know him and the players there. And he, uh, he said uh, he, put, he put down the equivalent of $25,000. On one hand. What hand? He got two A's. Do you play blackjack? Yes, I do. Okay. So he got another eight. So now he's splitting. Two aces or an eight. He split two he, he split the eights. Okay, got you. He gets another eight. So he splits it again. What does so the dealer he's got, have? He's got three eights and seventy five thousand dollars. I've got one hand twenty five dollars. He gets another eight. <laughs> oh, go on. Come everybody's on. Kinda, everybody's kind of gathering. And he turns around and he said, uh, Chuck, go give me some more money. And Chuck is Charles Barkley. <laughs> oh, standing right behind us watching. Charles, so everything delayed. Well, Charles went over and got a bunch of money. He said, where's the money? Uh, I'm good for it. So Charles goes over and uses his own money and gets, gets Michael uh, another 50000 or something. And so... He gets four eights, and he's you get for people who don't know you get uh, one, one card. Down. Right. He loses all four hands, first hand. So I now it's my turn, and I get blackjack. <laughs> I'm going yeah, because uh, uh, I'm winning the equivalent of about seventy five dollars. Right. right. And Jordan said, "If I were you, would he?" I wouldn't be so happy about it <laughs> because he was so pissed off. I'll say this. He came back and he ended up winning. Well, you, that's not your question. Your question is the most fun you ever had. Charles and Michael and I then went to the bar down the street. And I always remember Charles Barkley said, you can't be a drunk in this town. And I said, why not? He said, I just bought you guys uh, two beers, and our three beers cost about $80. <laughs> he said, I can't get drunk in this town. But we drank all night and talked, and that led up to the dream team in Barcelona. Was Jordan the most that you've covered? You've seen a lot of guys in sports. Was Michael Jordan the most larger-than-life character you've ever been around? That's a sharp question. Uh Later, yeah, I don't think, I covered Dr. J and became friends with Julius Serving, and I thought he was the most fascinating player I'd ever been. Very, very intelligent player, very good guy. And then when Michael came along and I go, boy, it, is it really possible that there can be somebody that's got more magic tricks than, than Julius mm -hmm. Irving and, and has more body control? And, and it did. Uh, larger than life, Remember the, uh, I wrote about this not long ago. Everybody remembers the flu game. Of course, of course. You got the bad pizza, whatever. I had walked out of the arena in Salt Lake City, was sitting on a picnic table where the employees, people, the staff, you know, people who cleaned up the arena could yeah. go out there and have lunch and stuff. And I just sat on, I was just trying to get away from the crowd. It was in the NBA finals and I walked outside. It was a couple hours, about five o'clock, the game was going to start at seven. And a car opened, uh, and out came a couple of guys and Michael Jordan. And now I know Michael from our time in uh, Barcelona and covering him yeah. over the years. And I said, what are you doing here? You're not going to play tonight. 
you're sick. And he said, well, I'm going to try and play. He said, wait a second. And he stopped in the middle of talking and walked around the side of the building and threw up because I could hear him vomiting over there. And he came back and he's kind of wiping his face like a person would have just threw up. And he said, well, I'm going to give it a go. And he went in and as you know, he had 37 points, 18 rebounds, uh, 14 assists. Uh, he led them to victory that night. And at one point he kind of came by the press table and I was kind of looking at him and he looked over and he kind of, he didn't stick out his thumb, his, his, uh, he didn't stick out his, his mouth. They didn't, uh, he didn't do the usual things. He just kind of winked at me. Like, <laughs> I told you I was going to try and play. Woody, who, who's a guy, you're full of stories. It's unbelievable. Who is a guy around the media, okay, a well-known guy that was just terrible with the media, that's a guy that you just did not want to be around? Because for me, like uh, a guy that I would think is like an Alex Rodriguez. Who's a guy you just couldn't stand to be around? He was just a rude person. Well, I would say the other thing. Uh, Rodriguez, and I, I never really had much of a relationship, but I wasn't with him all the time. But Derek Jeter was one of the best guys. Oh, God. I thought you were going to say bad, Woody. I'm a Yankee no. fan. You scared the shit out of me. No, not at all. I, I will give you my idol. One of my two idols when I was a kid was Mickey Mantle. And uh, I never covered him when he was playing. I'm not that old, but – when he came out with a book called uh, The Mick in the 70s or 80s, and uh, I told the book, he was coming to Denver for book signing, and the, uh, the book owner, book store owner said, uh, would you like to have him on your show? And I went, oh yeah, Mickey, yeah, I've never been around him. And I got to know, I got to know Billy Martin really well sure. before that. Martin told me a great funny story I could finish with today but uh so Mano came in and he was drunk and it was in the morning and I could hear him saying uh I don't want to do the show I don't want to sign these books just get me in and out of here and so the agreement was I promoted it for weeks and weeks like you promoting a, a, a good podcast you're getting and 5,000 people showed up I mean 5,000 people in a mall showed up to get Mickey to sign their autograph and uh, I said, I'm going to go on the air here. He's not going to do the show is what his agent told me. And I said, I'm going to go on the air and say, you know, I'm sorry I brought you out here. But, so anyway, to cut through the story. And so I walked over to him and I said, Mickey, you got to be on the show. You got to sign these books. These people came for you. And he looked at me and said, fuck you. <laughs> and turned around and walked off. So my theme music started. And I've got to explain what just happened. Well, people heard him say that. I mean, they heard him and they think, what is what he going to do? He's going to really rip on him. And I went, well, you know, my special guest today was supposed to be Mickey Mantle. <laughs> Mickey Mantle. 5,000 bucks. Uh, and, the, and, and the sea parted like the Red Sea. And Mickey came up and sat down and said, Woody Page, hey, yeah, let's talk some <laughs> sports for a while. And somebody told him, you really don't want to do this. And so he did do, I never took a commercial break. I did an hour with him. And he was wasted. He was drunk. Oh, yeah. He went over and, and, and they agreed that he would not sign books, but he would sign them at some point and everybody would give one. And he went off to go drinking because uh, that's, that's what he was doing late in his life. He said, uh, when he had the liver transplant, he said, if I had uh, known I was going to end up like this, I wouldn't have had so much to drink my whole life. <laughs> He was, he was a bad alcoholic. So on that side, was he bad with the media? Not when he was playing, not when he was a, a star. Actually, people in New York, Yankees fans, liked him better than they liked Roger Maris. Roger Maris was the good guy, but right. he, he took all the grief because he was breaking, uh, he was beating Mickey Mantle in their race. We just went through the, the show on ESPN about Sosa and McGuire. Well, that was awesome, by the way. Yeah, it was. I, I throw it because I was in St. Louis. Uh, you watched the whole thing? Yeah, fantastic. I was, I was in St. Louis for that series, the two-game series between the Cubs and and the Cardinals. And someone called me last night and said, what do you remember? I said, I remember they brought a 1,000 Krispy Kreme donuts into the press box because <laughs> <laughs> there was so much press there for those two games. I was looking to see if you could see me in the press conferences where they – they had a press conference before the game, and we're talking about. My thing is, 
But I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Woody, but no. my thing is, how does Sammy Sosa, I, I think he could not have handled that interview worse. I think he had every chance finally to come into the light or, or give some type of, you know, re- release some demon, say something, and he's doing great. And all of a sudden the steroids thing comes up and he could not have looked worse the way he declined that. And it's kind of, this is this guy's one last shot. You know, when are we going to have another Sammy Sosa yeah. thing? Because it would be good if there was a reunion between the Cubs and, and Sosa. I mean, it would be nice. Yeah. But it's kind of like the Pete Rose. You know, Pete Rose would not reveal that he gambled on games forever. And finally, it was too late. He finally did. Because if Pete Rose had told the commissioner at the time, yes, I gambled. Okay, we'll kick you out of baseball for five years. And then you come back. But because he didn't tell the truth for so long. I think that's what so, exacerbated his relationship with baseball. Yes, yeah, Sosa had his chance. McGuire kind of danced. Yeah, yeah. McGuire danced. Mm-hmm. He was saying, I think I would have done it if there hadn't been anything. You didn't hear him say, you didn't hear him address, oh yeah, I decided one day to start taking steroids. He, he didn't do it. But at the same time, McGuire had already admitted to it. Sure, yes. He had... Jason Giambi admitted yeah. to it. I got to know Jason late in his career. Woody, while, while I got you, I, I got to ask you this question, okay? This, this one I, I, I got to ask. With that being said, okay, you work for ESPN, and I'm, I got to bring him up again. A guy like Alex Rodriguez, who had every single chance to say it and come out and doesn't and doesn't and doesn't. Finally, he leaves, totally resurrects his career. It's like everybody kind of forgot about it. Does it bother you now that a guy can come in and just get a job with ESPN that quickly? I mean, he had every well, chance was, to admit to it. You know, let me defend my network. That they don't care what I do. Please. You know, he was with Fox first. So, I mean, you true. he kind of established himself doing the postseason with Fox. It doesn't surprise me. We're – are we a great country right now? We're a struggling country, but we've always given people – uh, second and third and fourth chances. I mean, we gave uh, Richard Nixon second chance. I mean, he, he got it and became president of the United States. Uh, we uh, we tended to give uh, Lance a pass, and he's trying to resurrect his career like A-Rod, but we've done that. Jason Giambi came back and was a coach, almost was a manager in baseball. Uh, if, if Sosa had just admitted that he took steroids. A different ball game. He, he'd be fine. I mean, he'd be a, an occasional toast and not toast, but he would be toasted in Chicago. He'd be back with them. But he, I think, I believe, and it was reinforced. I, I, let me go back. I'm interrupting myself. You can interrupt me anytime. It's your, your show. But Sosa the next year after the run, was caught with the cork bat. Remember yes, that? Yes, that's what started it all. Yeah. I was in Chicago for the NBA Finals the playoffs. I went out to see him, and I had spent time with both him and McGuire, not personally, but in the masses of press, during the home run run, Chase. Yeah. And the next year when I saw him, now they're testing. It wasn't the same body. You're totally different? Totally different. Because I was in there at the court. All I could think of was, this is not the same guy I saw Holy the year before. shit. Because when I saw Barry Bonds, when the accusation started, he had a chair in the Giants clubhouse at, at Candlestick Park in the corner. And he took up like four places because he wanted that. And I went over to him and I started laughing and I asked him a question and he said, uh, I don't want to talk to you. And I stood there for a minute. His head was so big. I had, I had first met him when he was in spring training, when he was with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah. And he was a slight guy. Slight is not weak, weakling, but he was a guy who choked up on the bat and was a singles and doubles hitter. And I saw him at the end of his career and I went, I've always heard about steroids causing your, you know, to have pimples on your 
shoulders yeah. and your body, but the, the head would blow up. He had the biggest head I've ever seen on a human being. I mean, it was like something out of Greek that, mythology. That's amazing. At, at, at the thing you know you say about Sosa's body that it was that substantial because before he took the steroids, I mean, they showed it even in the documentary. I think oh, he yeah. had like thirteen homers. I mean, he really wasn't putting balls out that much, and then all of a sudden, boom. Well, Isn't they it? made the point, McGuire said it, and, and it was true that when they when they started doing the steroids, there was no rule against it. Uh, baseball didn't know how to handle it. The media, including me, had no clue of what – I didn't know what steroids had meant. I, I will, I'm sure you've heard of Lyle Alzado, who was a great defensive end for the Broncos, the Cleveland, and the Raiders. And people remember him from the end of his career. I walked in in the 80s into the Broncos locker room, and I knew uh, an offensive lineman very well. I'll leave him out of it. But I said, what is that smell? It smells like somebody has cancer because that's the, that is the smell that steroids for elderly people who had cancer, they give them steroids. So it was this horrific smell that I'd smelled a couple of times in a hospital. And I said to this, the left tackle for the Dave Studder, I'll mention him. It's, yeah. And I said, what is that smell? He said, that's uh, Alzado and his steroids. And I'm not going to look good in this story. And I said, why do they smell it? like cancer? And he said, well, that's what they're used for is cancer rehabilitation. And I said, he's taking steroids? He said, yeah, go look at his butt. And he had a big boil on his butt where he was injecting the shots. And I went back to Stuttered and I said, uh, can he get away with that? He said, sure, there are no rules about it. <laughs> and that, that was true in the NFL. It was true and nobody was taking him in the NBA. They were doing weed all the time. Everybody so, in that place was but your, for, from your standpoint as a journalist and you travel with these teams, like for instance, the Broncos, 35, you're traveling with these guys, you're writing about these guys. Isn't it hard to tell the truth or get the good stories as far as ask the right questions? Cause then a player will hold it against you. You've seen, you know, what happened to people as big as LeBron where they get upset at a reporter. Don't you kind of have to tiptoe that? Well, uh, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a probably good area to explore because I would cover with pro ba cover pro basketball teams, and I would go down the floor. I'd be on the same floor with the players, and I could smell the marijuana wafting out of the rooms. I didn't write about it. Uh, it really wasn't against the rules. In regard to steroids, I didn't understand steroids. I mean, that was part of the show last night. None of us, from the commissioner of baseball, but down to but, the players, but you know what, Woody, and and part of me, but I'm not even I'm not even just saying steroids. If a player has a bad game, if if you, there's a time where you you need to ask a question that's a tough question, are you worried about it? Because a, you got to travel with these guys. B, you still want to have a good story, and you still want them to be open to talking to you. And if you bash them, you're done. So you almost got to suck up to them, no? No, I I never did. Good. Really, well, that's why we yeah. like you here on the Brown the Dump Show. Woody. No, I just uh, I, I never did. I was honest, and uh, Tom Jackson, you remember? Yeah, him of course. From he, and he, he was great. Did. Tom and I were good friends, and uh, one day he came up. So I'm going to go along with you on this. You're you're right to an extent, maybe even more than an extent. Tom came up to me at a Broncos practice. He was an All Pro linebacker. And he came up and he said, uh, Woody, I'm going to get a hammy. And, and I just thought he was kind of kidding. And practice started and he grabbed his hamstring. <laughs> and as he's walking out, he says, meet me in my car. And so I don't know what the hell this is all about. And so he goes in the locker room and I go around the gym where the Broncos were training. And he drove a Corvette. That was popular car for players then. And so I went up and waited. He came out a few minutes later and he said, you got to listen to Luther Vandross. I just got a new CD or eight track or whatever it was during that time. And we got in the car and Tom lit up a joint and he said, share it with me. And I said, no, nah, I got to work. I had to write and everything. So we sat in the car and there's total smoke in the car. You can imagine that. We got oh, yeah. Listening to Luther Vandross. And he, uh, 
uh, he sat there and spoke that joy because his, his day is over, practice is finished. And I never told that story, maybe till now, I don't know. But uh, Tom was one of three Broncos that were included in, a, in an investigation for uh, marijuana use long before it was actually uh, considered a, a major problem in the NFL. But you're probably right that uh, one night with two quarterbacks for the Broncos during the off season, uh, we were playing in a charity golf tournament and two guys got really drunk, started the backup quarterback and they came down a, 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 a stair rail. Well, they sliding down the banister and they both fell off. And the next day, they, the next day was the start. That was the weekend before training camp started. And the, the coach announced, Red Miller announced the first day of practice that neither one of them could practice because they had injured themselves in the gym. No, they had injured themselves and I never told that story. So you're probably right. You're probably right. But I know that over the years I wrote things, uh, John Elway said at the end of his career, he said, what do you wrote really lousy things about me? You wrote great things about me. He said, you wrote fair about me. But and so I think that's you, what I let's say to you do. write a bad story about John Elway. You're covering the Broncos. You show up that next day to the locker room. Are you a little worried about your interaction with John? And and that's what I'm saying with covering these things, not just John Elway. This is anybody covering any team. You're with them all the time. But do you have to worry about shit? I just wrote a bad piece about John Elway. He's going to give me a lot of attitude in the locker room. Well, that's probably true, but. Uh... I think the most important thing, Robbie, was showing up. But if you don't show up, you're admitting that you're afraid. There was a guy, you know, I'm going to come up with his name in a minute. There was a pro basketball player that Larry Cannon, who signed with the, in the ABA, and he played awful. And I wrote that the guy was clouded by his pocketbook. That was something really bad about him. And the next day I showed up and he was ready to, kill me I mean, literally yeah. and another player got in between us and said because I said to him if you hit me I'm going to get half that six million bucks you just signed for and because I would have sued him for assault and battery but a player walked in and said you know it's not he's not worth it is what he said he's not worth it just walk away and he kind of pulled Larry Cannon away but I had a coach once who uh uh, back in the old American Basketball Association that came, I'd written that the team had dissension. And he was right. He came up to me at the airport and said, every team that has won 19 games has dissension. But I quoted sources, I did, players that I didn't name. And he lined up the players and he said, come over and he grabbed me by the arm and he said to the first player, did you talk to him? Are you one of his sources? Well, none of the players were gonna admit to being sources. So he went through and he said, you made this all up. And the players are winking at me and stuff. And he said, you're never allowed on a plane that we're on. This wasn't charter. This was regular. And you're not allowed to stay in the hotels with us. And I said, well, you can't keep me from either one. And so he never talked to me again the rest of the year. And if I was in the media group, he'd say, I'm not going to talk until Paige leaves. And I wouldn't leave. And the other media people would get upset with me. But I went through that a lot of times uh, throughout my career, but you have to be, I think, uh, honest. And that's what I always try. That's what I was taught by my parents, you know, be honest. So I, even at the, I had players that would never talk to me again because of that. And the, the, the Nugget Center, uh, Dan Issel came to me once and said, uh, the players were boycotting, all boycotting, talking to me. Uh, because I had written that Monty Tao was just a caddy for David Thompson. They played together at North Carolina State. And he said, the players didn't like that. They, they didn't want to talk to you. And I said, well, that's their right. And two days later, they were talking to me again. So, uh, yeah, I wrote bad things about, uh, about uh, the quarterbacks that I've had the closest relationship with were John Elway, Peyton Manning, and Tim Tebow. And I would write bad things about Tebow, and he'd talk to me all the time. And the same thing, I mean, at the end of his career, Peyton Manning wasn't very good. Uh, I wrote about it, and I think it depends on their personality more than mine. They knew that would I Peyton talked. Would Peyton get upset at you if you wrote a bad piece, or he'd let that go? Yeah, yeah. no, he would he, let it go. Yeah, he let it go. 
but there were players. I mean, I've dealt with 25,000 players, I guess, that wouldn't let it go. And I understood that. I don't know that if, if I get off this show and I go write a column later today saying you're the worst podcast uh, guy that I've ever been around, you're not going to want to talk to me. You're going to go, he seemed like he was a nice guy to me. Right. Uh, but I, I wasn't hiding it. I mean, if somebody shit the bed as a player in three or four, I, I, I remember distinctly, well, let me tell you a good story. Rod Smith, who was, who was probably going to be in the Hall of Fame as a wide receiver, probably the Denver Broncos' top receiver of all time, was retiring and I was out at the Broncos headquarters and he never talked to me. He, he, his entire career, Shannon Sharp would talk to me all the time, even if I ripped him, he'd talk to me, uh, who ends up being with Skip Bayless after me. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny how that works. But Rod Smith never talked to me his entire career. And he walked over to me before he's about to go up on stage to announce his retirement. And he said, I'm gonna mention you today. And I thought, uh oh, here it comes. He said, you're the reason why I'm, uh, I'm one of the greatest receivers of all time. He said, you should listen to this. He gets up there and explains that in his rookie season, undrafted free agent, quarterback out of Southeast Missouri, they change him to wide receiver. Uh, he plays his first game at, on special teams. He's the punt returner. He fair catches twice. And I write a column saying, what's wrong with this kid? He's supposed to be a pretty good athlete. He fair caught. He's trying to make the team as a free right. agent. And you can't fair catch. This guy's got no career. He's going to have no career. He is, in fact, if John Elway throws him a pass, he's going to put up his hand and fair catch it. And I said, he's got no chance of making the NFL. Well, he took that as motivation. Yep, that I'll show it. that guy. I'll show that old white guy. I'll show him that I can make it in the league. And he said, you're the reason why I had a great career. And he gets up and says that in front of all these people. And, and he had been holding that grudge for so long. since the first week, but he did admit that it, it, it motivated him. Woody, so, I tell you, you are a man full of stories. I love it. You're a perfect podcast guy. Where can folks find your podcast if they want the stories to keep, keep right in there? It's called unmutable because I get muted. I probably got muted to, uh, 10,000 times on around the horn. It's called it unmutable, the Woody page podcast. And we just had Terrell Davis on, uh, this week, uh, talking about his career and talking about, uh, uh, black lives matters and what's going on with the racial discrimination and the hopes for racial equality. Uh, I've had the commissioner, I, the, uh, the former commissioner, but, was on and we talked about steroids so we've had cool. uh, I'll tell you what when you asked me about the uh, let me finish with a real quick story uh, Alan Shepard was the first man in space and I got an opportunity to play golf with him in a charity tournament in in the mountains of Colorado in Vail and I asked him people who are familiar with him will know he was the first astronaut on the moon who hit a golf ball that's a famous story that yeah. he they made a piece of uh, of the uh, of the landing craft that was like a golf club, and they could put a six iron on the bottom of it. So I asked him while we we're playing golf. I said, "What kind of golf ball did you?" He said, "I've been asked that a thousand times." And he said, "I would never say." And his lady friend came over to me a little bit later and said, "He doesn't want to admit what kind of golf ball he hit on the moon because it was a practice range ball with circles around it." <laughs> And there's still his golf balls on the moon. So that night we got drunk. Sounds like my stories end up. Being yeah. Drunk. A lot of these stories end with you getting drunk. Yeah. So Alan Shepard, who was like, forget all the athletes I've ever met. Alan Shepard was the first man in space, not the first man on the moon, but he later went to the moon. Uh, and I said to him as we're walking down the street and I look up at the moon and I said, uh, would you have wanted to be the first man on the moon? He said, yeah. And I said, what do you think when you look up at the moon? Oh, my daughter's life. He replied, well, Woody, it's slurring. He said, I look up at the moon and say, I can't believe I walked on that fucker. <laughs> and I said, good thing you weren't the first man on the moon. 
instead of one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, you'd go, I'm walking on this fucker. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the words that we would have lived by forever. So, Woody, so Woody can you me give me, up. you know what, you got to give me one more. And I, I, I forget where I heard it. I think it was your podcast. Um, again, folks, that's unmutable. You tell a great Stephen A. Smith story when you had a dinner with two executives. Do you know where, do you know where well, I'm going with this? Well, we were doing dream job. I don't know what it was. We, we were doing dream job and, uh, uh, and we went to a famous steak restaurant, in New York and, and, uh, and Stephen A said, Oh, I don't want to go there. I'll be recognized and it'll ruin the whole evening. And so we go to this, uh, down the meat, meat packing area of New York city. And he sits, Howard Cosell, and I knew Howard Cosell. Howard Cosell didn't want to be bothered by people, but he'd put a chair in the entrance to the bar. And people come up and go, Howard, you gotta leave me alone. Well, he always wanted to be recognized. Well, that was kind of the Stephen A. Smith thing where he, two guys came in, a Boston Red Sox fan, so it was the Yankees and the Red Sox were playing there. And he went, oh God, this is gonna be awful. This is a terrible thing you're talking. And they came over and they kind of pushed him aside. He came over to me and said, what are you doing? We love you in Boston and everything like that. And so it was a tough night for Stephen A. But I will, <laughs> I will tell you the other side. So I go back to New York on occasion uh, to do shows for ESPN. And I was there a few months ago, right before we went into this mess we're in. And I do the show with Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman. And I do Will Kane's show. You're probably Yeah, familiar. yeah, of course. He just moved and to I Fox, do actually. The horn and I do like six shows. They were getting their money's worth after me. And I got to catch a plane back to Colorado that night. And I go outside and there's a nice black town car parked. And they told me there'd be a car that rushed me to the airport. And I go over and I said, well, uh, I guess you're here for me. I'm Woody Page and you're going to take me to the airport. And he said, uh, no, I'm here to pick up Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> and so I had to slink over into the corner. And Stephen A. came by and said, you trying to steal my car? And I went, no. But I got my comeuppance. Whatever happened. At, at, oh, that's at awesome. the, okay, I'm ready to go. You know, here I am. Uh, let's go to the airport anyway. Woody, you're a character, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Would love to have you back. I know you're a busy guy. We'll let you get going. As always, thanks for being on the Brownlee Dumb Show. Where do we find the Woody Page podcast on Mutable? It's like yours. It's all over everywhere. It's on iHeartRadio, Apple. And, Beautiful. And we hope you'll come on sometime. You I'll say the word, Woody. I'll be ready for you. It was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, we'll do it again sometime and go in a different direction. Uh, because I, I am writing a, I'm writing, not memoirs, not not an autobiography. I'm not good enough to do that. But the name of the the book is I wouldn't believe this shit either. So now you have to decide today whether you believe in the shit that I told you during the course of the day. We'll let Thanks the fans be the judge. Woody, I appreciate you, buddy. You take care. Okay. Stay safe. Talk soon. All right, folks. There you have it. Woody Page, ESPN, um, ES. P.N. I wish I would have asked him about that. I would have said, Woody, why can Rachel Nichols not say ESPN normal? I'm Rachel Nichols. ESPN. It's like, oh, geez, just say ESPN. You would save 10 minutes of the show. Love Rachel Nichols, though. But that was phenomenal stuff. I tried. I kept trying to dig in on A-Rod. I wanted them to take the bait so bad. I held it out there multiple times. I was ready to just bash A-Rod. He wouldn't take it. Maybe he actually likes him. Maybe it wasn't even bait to him. But I tried. I put it out there. I got some Skip Bayless stuff. I got some Stephen A. Smith stuff. Uh, good stuff all around. Folks, the Burnley Dumb Show keeps rocking and rolling. We will see you next week. That's Friday because we do this Tuesday after Friday, Tuesday after Friday. That is Grace Ibrahim behind the glass on the ones and twos. I'm Big Game Bob. We will see you Friday, folks. Take care.